London by William Blake tells the story of a speaker walking through London in the 18th century, a time of industrialization, scientific advancement and religious questioning. In his depiction, Blake presents London as inherently oppressive, denying its people the freedom to live happy, joyful lives. In most of his works, Blake illustrated his anger and frustration with the establishment, often painting a picture of sinful, corrupt tyranny. Blake himself was a really interesting person. In fact, many people thought he was mad. He didn't help himself by saying that he saw visions of angels and saints and could talk to the dead. But ultimately, Blake was a genius. And he encapsulated that quintessential romantic interest in the limits of reason. Blake was fiercely against the establishment and thought that they abused their power and position, often oppressing the people beneath them. He was also really against scientific thought at the time, saying that they were exceptionally restrictive, killing all form of creativity and imagination. To try and get a better understanding of what the London was like during Blake's life, we can have a look at these famous paintings by William Hogarth. Like Blake, he shared the bleak vision of the alienated metropolis, highlighting its vulgarity and depicting the painful truth. Look closely at the faces and notice the marks of weakness, marks of woe, both direct quotations from the poem. Blake uses lots of sounds in his poems to bring the pain and suffering to the fore. So study both images and imagine what it would have sounded like to be standing in the centre of both of these events. Like Blake, Hogarth conveyed no joy or happiness in the city or its people. Something Blake believed was created by industrialisation, forcing a desire for material goods and corrupt capitalism. When describing William Blake, William Wordsworth said that there is something in the madness of this man which interests me more than the sanity of others, suggesting that he appreciated the vivid and controversial ideas communicated in Blake's work. Remember also that the misery and pain of Blake's poem London was his own true depiction as he lived and grew up right in the centre of it. In fact, he had the Industrial Revolution on his doorstep. The images he creates are not just metaphors, they are facts about what was going on and the conditions of England at the time. As a result of the suffering, Blake said that he felt he was fiercely against the establishment, something that is strongly portrayed in his writing. And ultimately, Blake's poem London touches on the social ills of the time and exposes the injustices of a corrupt system and a lack of freedom. So, to summarise, William Blake's poem exposes the social ills of the time enforced by the tyranny of the establishment. The poem describes a walk through London, which is presented as a pained, oppressive and impoverished city in which all the speaker can find is misery. Of course, lots of people can see the relevance of Blake's messages in society today. Before we walk with Blake through his perception of London, see if you can picture your own experience of walking through your streets of London. Think about what you might see. Think about what you might hear and what you might feel. What do you see reflected in the faces of the people around you? Happiness and joy or weakness and pain? Really reflect on some of the imagery Blake creates in his poem and notice how relevant some of the messages are to you today. Now let's have a look at the poem itself. But remember, this is part of your comparative question in your GCSEs, and we don't compare poems line by line. So think more about big ideas as we talk through this. I wander through each chartered street, near where the chartered Thames does flow, and mark in every face I meet, marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban, the mind-forged manacles, I hear how the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. But most through midnight streets, I hear how the youthful harlots curse, blast the newborn infant's tear, and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. As we look at the poem, notice the word chartered. 
Here, Blake accentuates a sense of ownership. The establishment seemed to own everything, even the rivers, something we usually associate with flowing freely and naturally, but now only adding to that sense of imprisonment and restriction. The repetition of chartered adds to the mechanical monotony of the oppressed people of London. Notice also how the speaker wanders through London, the image of which is slow, aimless and almost despondent. It's like they have no sense of purpose or determination. After reading these lines, it's clear that Blake highlights the oppression of the people of London right from the very outset. To further emphasise the extent of the misery, Blake reminds us that the speaker sees marks in every single face that they pass as they walk through the streets of London. Here, the speaker of the poem depicts Blake's London where all seems ripped apart by extreme poverty and tyrannical enforcements of those in power. The word mark is particularly interesting here. A mark could be in reference to a scar or a cut, something permanent and painful, like the suffering of the people that are made to endure it. The repetition of it shows the extent of this permanent suffering. Everything and everyone is marked. Woe, of course, tells us that the people feel great sorrow and distress. Furthermore, marks of weakness is significant in further accentuating the depressing reality of London during the time of empire and showing strength. Pretty depressing and overwhelming so far. It's almost like it's inescapable, even as the reader was surrounded by misery. The first quatrain really set the scene for us, but as we move on to this second verse, we are presented with specific examples of the misery in London. More than anything, we now get a fierce critique of humankind's failure to build a society based on love, joy, freedom, and a communion with God. The repetition of every highlights again the monotony of life and the relentless misery of the oppressed. Make note of the sounds that Blake obsesses over in these lines and in the rest of the poem. London is decidedly an oral poem, but it is concerned with the voicelessness rather than the voice. Blake may mention every voice, but we never hear anyone's voice utter anything specific. The mouth is used to cry, sigh and curse, but never to utter anything meaningful or any objection or opposition to the manacles that keep Londoners in their psychological chains. Interestingly, men are compared to infants here, both of which are crying. Again, Blake highlights the weakness of those that we would usually consider to be strong, suggesting a hopelessness to overthrow the tyranny of the establishment. Now we get a famous line that's referenced in many literary works today. The phrase, mind-forged manacles, seems to be the very core of this poem. The fact that the manacles are mind-forged emphasises that the restraints are not inevitable, but created in a twisted mind of both the oppressor and of the sufferer who accepts the chains. Perhaps here, the mind-forged manacles represent Blake's perception of self-imposed social and intellectual restrictions. And I guess it's because of that that Blake expressed his belief in the importance of the imagination this line is particularly powerful as it suggests that the oppressed are unlikely to ever rise up and challenge that which tyrannises over them. In the I hear and cry of this line, Blake stresses the sounds of suffering and pain, highlighting the hopelessness surrounding the social injustices. Here, the injustice is the heartless exploitation of children working as chimney sweepers. Blake hated how the church and establishments corrupted and exploited the innocent child, perhaps why we get so many infants crying in this poem, and now a direct reference to the chimney sweepers themselves. As we reflect on this, it's horrifically sad how the children gave up their childhood to survive. The job in particular kept the pollution going, creating that dirty, smoggy, industrialised image that Blake is so desperate to portray. And of course, it's impossible to forget that it is this exploitation of these poor, innocent children that helped to build the London we live in and know so well today. The third stanza sees two institutions associated with wealth and grandeur, the church and the palace, both invaded by the corrupt realities of Blake's London. By describing the church as blackening, it can be taken literally as the smoggy pollution of London created a thick smog that suffocated the city. 
but also the blackening can be interpreted metaphorically in that the church's reputation was being tarnished by their blatant lack of response to the corruption of society. The word appalls only emphasises this. It also means the cover that's laid on a coffin, influencing the reader to think of the church as effectively dead, burying its traditional principles in order to satisfy its capitalist phenomenon. The gruesome image of the blood running down palace walls is particularly strong as it shows how soldiers' blood is symbolically marking the palace walls, and most importantly, the walls of ultimate power, making it obvious to the whole of society that death and suffering is ever-present all around them. The description of how the church appalls could be interpreted in different ways. The root word, for example, is a uh, pull or to make pale, another reference to the enlightening role that the churches were supposed to undertake. The reference to the hapless soldiers sighing is similarly powerful. The deliberate use of sibilance provides an onomatopoeic hiss that conjures a particularly sinister atmosphere to emphasise the soldiers' ongoing weaknesses. They are forced into battle for a country they no longer appreciate or are appreciated by. The sighing really captures a remorseful, sluggish, powerless figure instead of the usually brave and noble soldier, now lacking in hope, imagination and energy. The final quatrain opens with the line, but most through midnight streets, I hear, and now we get a picture of what happens at night time in Blake's London. And here he just further emphasises how dirty and dangerous the city is in quite an expressive and intense way mentioning the harlots mixed with the infants crying and then the plague of the marriage hearse. By describing the youthful harlots verbally disturbing these infants, the speaker gestures towards an ongoing cycle of misery, emphasising that the loss of childhood and innocence is just really prevalent throughout. Here, Blake appears to mean that young, unmarried mothers, unwanted children and the misery of both mother and child alike is the ultimate unbreakable curse of living in Blake's London, dominated by a tyrannical establishment. Blake here exposes another injustice, and that is that the victim of the harlot's curse is the newborn child. This is ironic because the newborn child of a prostitute or a woman who had no way to care for herself would have ended up in the care of the church and therefore destined to become a child labourer themselves as the church thought that putting children into child labour was a way of getting them off the streets. So again, just reinforcing this idea of the cyclical misery of London. Within the image of the marriage hearse, Blake just emphasises that he sees marriage as something else that enslaves the body and soul in much the same way as the mind forged manacles before. Blake even goes so far to suggest that we are plagued by this idea of marriage and death. But of course that word plague works on a few levels. First, it is that deadly and contagious disease, one that you can't get rid of and one that kills. But also it works on a metaphorical level, that cyclical cycle of imprisonment in marriage and in our own minds. We're plagued by it, we're haunted by it, and it's killing us physically and psychologically. Ultimately, Blake is suggesting that if his readers at that time and the readers of today don't listen and take on board his messages in this poem, then we're doomed to a life of misery and despair. I hope you're not feeling too depressed after that. Remember also that Blake was an artist. Let's have a quick look at some of his art. The first image is taken from the Bible and shows a king who is driven mad and forced to live like a wild animal as a punishment for his excessive pride. The second is influenced by John Milton who wrote Paradise Lost and this is a moment from there, the moment that the Archangel Michael shows Adam the misery that will be inflicted on man now that he had eaten the forbidden fruit. The final painting was painted a little while after London was written, but again depicts the vulgarity and the misery of life. Here, it's based on the poem, and the poem's protagonist descends into the outer circles of hell. He comes across the people around him that are stuck in this world we're in, shrieking with pain. Moving on to the final piece of this video, we're now going to look at big ideas. These are the ideas that you use in your comparisons. Of course there are loads, but here are just a few to get you started. 
Ultimately, Blake criticises the establishment. He seeks to expose the corruption and injustices within it. Secondly, Blake shows the effects of this tyranny and the oppression that it creates, predominantly in the people of London. Blake highlights the universal pain and suffering and the hopelessness of those that are oppressed. Blake conveys the abuse of power and status, particularly within the establishment. And finally, Blake illustrates the loss of identity in the people of London. Remember that it's these big ideas that you use when you compare to one other poem from Power and Conflict. So just reflect on those ideas and think about which poem it fits into best. Blake definitely criticises the establishment. Shelley also hated the establishment and was against the corruption. He definitely shows this in Ozymandias through the irony of the loss of power of the statue. Blake shows the effects of tyranny and the oppression that it creates. While in My Last Duchess, that duke definitely still oppresses his wife and the unknown person he's talking to. You get the idea. It's up to you now to go away and reflect further on this poem, its big ideas and which poems we can compare it to. That's all for now. Definitely watch one of my other poems on a different poem from Power and Conflict. Enjoy!